Amen. You know, I think uh, God has been fairly clear with me about what I'm called to do, and that's to eat the scroll and speak what He tells me to speak. I'm supposed to exposit Scripture, and then I use stories from my life to illustrate that. But my life's only so long, and uh, it's very particular. And it's really important, I think, for us to hear each other's stories and the stories that Jesus is writing in each of our lives. Christians get in the habit of calling that a testimony, which gets weird, but it's just saying, well, this is my relationship. Let me tell you about my relationship with Jesus and what uh, God means to me. I used to be pretty intimidated by other people's testimonies because I'd hear someone's testimony and think, oh, well, that means I need to go to prison and have this experience, or oh, I need to like go off to you know a mountaintop and have a vision of Jesus, or I need to be a, a single mother and have this uh, amazing story of how God reached me there. But over the years, I've realized, no, that's ridiculous. All those testimonies are not in competition with yours. They're all a gift to you because they're all the story of Jesus written on all of our individual and particular lives. And heaven, I think, is all about sharing these amazing stories. And I think the shocking news that I've discovered is, well, no story is any better than any other story. They're all different, and we're all in different places. And so I love to have some of you share your stories and preach from time to time. And I'm really excited that uh, Terry Hubbard is going to do that this morning. Um, Terry is extra special to me. Some of you may not know this, but last year I married Terry uh, to Ted, her husband, in a ceremony here at the church. And I think a lot of, and you remember Ted uh, preached a few weeks ago and Terry shared some of her story with me, and I said, well, that would be great for other people to hear as well. So, Terry, do you want to come up here, and um, maybe I can just pray for you, and then you can go to town. Okay. So, Father, I thank you so very much for Terry. I thank you for um, your life manifest in uh, her life, that her life is really your life. So, Lord, thank you for the beautiful person that you have made, that you're still making, And thank you, Lord Jesus, that Terry doesn't just belong to Ted. She belongs to all of us as your body, as your people. And so, Lord, I pray that as Terry shares um, about you, that you would help us to listen and that you would rise within us and that you would live out your life. And I know that you are in all of us, but I pray that this morning you would help us to see. So thanks for Terry. I pray for freedom for her, joy for her in talking about you. Um, Bless her father in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. All right. So I'd like to begin our time together um, by closing our eyes, quieting our minds, and saying another prayer in a second. So let's put away our thoughts that might be preoccupying us. Um, Maybe you've had an argument with someone. Um, You might be tired. Maybe you're worried about work or a friend. You and your partner had an argument or a bill needs paid and you don't get paid for two more weeks. Give that to God right now. Try and focus on this very moment, not yesterday and not tomorrow or even this afternoon. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we are here in your beautiful church with each other. We thank you for being real and true. We love you for teaching us that we don't need something tangible to know you're here. You show us if we listen. Thank you for guiding us to be authentic and showing us what unconditional love looks like. Thank you for your promises, patience, grace, and strength. Lord, please bless each and everyone listening right now. and Please guide this message today. You're the calm in our crisis, the strength when we feel like we have none, the guide when we get lost, the reason we experience pure joy, the giver of all gifts, and we thank you for being the gentle hands that cup our face and saying, I am here. Heavenly Father, bring us closer as a community today. Teach us something we maybe didn't know and touch our hearts with something new. Strengthen our bonds with loved ones and use each of us to tell your story so that others can know your love too. Heal our hearts, minds, spirits, 
bodies and souls from all pain and unrest. Teach us to live each day in pure, I like to call it our style. Realize, reflect, reset, revive, refresh, and reveal the real us. We thank you endlessly for being our everything. Love you and thank you in the name of Jesus. Okay, so I'm, I don't know how to lift this, Peter. I'm very blind. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, your, I'm like your roadie. But just, this second, this second, I'm getting it. Right there? Yep, perfect. Okay. okay. So I'm very, very grateful to have this opportunity. Um, as Peter said, I'm Terry Douglas Hubbard. Um, many of you, or most of you, know my husband, Ted. Um, he's my BFF, my teammate. I'm the cuter one, though. He's bald. <laughs> Sometimes um, we just bump into people and they suddenly, they're a part of your journey. So when Peter asked me if I would come share my story, I actually have to be honest, I felt, how am I worthy enough to tell all of these wonderful people my story when yours has to be much more exciting? After I told Peter I would love to come and speak, I immediately became very nervous. And again, what could I possibly say to everybody else? Um, then I asked myself a million questions, and I asked God a lot, too. And he just very clearly said to me, this is not only for them, it's for you. My road is no less or no more important or even extra than others. It's obviously real to me. Um, your road is real to you, and sharing that is extremely important for us. When I get asked about the joys of my life, I have many, although sometimes I have to admit I struggle to find anything. I get sucked into the pity I feel about one reason or another, and then I feel very ungrateful. So sharing my joys, my strengths, mistakes, and my triumphs is kind of why I'm here. God has proven himself on, I originally put hundreds of occasions. I widened it out and said thousands, if not more, throughout my 51 years. He's demanded things of me in the most gentle way, I'm sure you know. I fought him, denied him, yelled at him, begged him, and even ignored him and pretended that he wasn't there. He stood still, he never left. When I close my eyes and I think of God and what I want to hear from him at that moment, I see a very beautiful, blurred, white light and that is the most safe I've ever felt in my life. And I close my eyes and see that vision. It's most often a positive when we share our journey with others, like Peter said. So here's my journey. The central verses God led me to, um, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 9. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Verse 16 through 17. So we do not lose heart, though. Our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So the words of these verses are a little different than the verses or the words of today's message, but they mean the same for the most part. Um, words like broken, destroyed, shattered, annihilated, mutilated, defeated, they all represent something that is not able to be completely and 100% fixed or restored. So I chose today to talk about how God doesn't want us to feel those things that I just spoke of. He wants us to turn to him when the damage originally occurs. I admit I'm not good at it. I let it, I let it boil up. I let it just, I pretend it's not there. I've done it for years. And when that does happen, the pain often increases, deepens, and sometimes morphs into something you don't even realize. Nothing is broken in such a way that the Creator will not fix it and fix it such that it is better than before. 
Thank you, Peter. Damage can be fixed most often. My husband can fix anything, and I mean anything. Things you can't see, he fixes it. Huge, major things that need overhauls, he fixes it. He figures it out. He's told me stories of things that he's fixed, and I'm in awe. I'm literally thinking, boy, I would have saved a lot of money had I known you many, many years ago. Um, he didn't back down when he learned about me and my scars. It's a work in progress <laughs> and something I fight. But he's steadfast, never weary and dedicated to me and our journey. Okay, all right. <laughs> Other words for damaged as an example. Flawed, unfinished, imperfect, weakened. That's the worst one for me. I'm known for trying to strengthen myself. I don't need anyone else. The situation or whatever it may be without turning to God for his strength. I'm also really good at pretending I'm strong without anybody. And I'm sure many of you do the same. When I go to the Safeway near our house, there is this section in the very, very back, and we live in Boulder, that's got a 50% off discount section. Well, Boulder has a sugar tax, so I didn't realize this till not too long ago, but if you go to the, the cooler and you want to buy a Pure Life sweet tea, it's $3.60 some cents. If you want to buy an unsweetened tea, it's $1.40. Just to be, it's just, it's, yeah. So that lots of things are on sale in the back because nobody buys anything with sugar. So you go to the back, you want lots of payday bars. There's a big old box back there because nobody buys them because they're twice as expensive. Um, so just because they're discounted doesn't mean they're useless. They might simply just be something that's overstock, return for packaging that might have a dent or a scratch. Again, it doesn't mean it's useless. Many other stores have a discounted section as well. And there are even merchants that sell things that are damaged somehow very minimally and some very much so. Still good and can be useful, like us. Living in this world today, we struggle with the bumps while cruising along on our journeys. I love the word journey. I also love seeing others going through their journeys and supporting them when they feel like they need to veer to the right or to the left on another path, a new path. Some experiences wound us. They leave us impaired either physically, emotionally, or spiritually, or all of the above. We all have scars. What's a scar? Well, it was once a wound from some kind of trauma, big or small, or both, direct or indirect. Through time and nurturing, the wound heals, almost always heals. It leaves some type of result that reminds us of the wound and how it got there. Again, it could be minor. You may not even see it unless up close. You may not see it at all, but you feel it. I'm sure this comparison has been used a thousand times in your life, but I feel it's very simple and very true. One time I heard this saying, God can bring greatness out of great mess. So hard to imagine sometimes when we're actually in that yucky place. Whatever greatness means to you, expect more because God's willing to give it to you. My mom always told my sister and I that everything happens for a reason and something good comes out of everything. When things went bad for one reason or another growing up, she stood strong when she said the, made those statements. Secretly, I rolled my eyes and thought, oh, geez. Hi, Mom. Not, how, how could God do these things to me when things were bad? God is not weak, she would say. He does not step aside without fighting for us. He's totally in our corner. He works behind the scenes. We tend to focus on the mess, the dysfunction, the broken dream, the betrayal, the hurt, and the weakness. But in all the mess, God sees greatness. He knows how to take our troubles and turn them into miracles. He knows how to talk you off a ledge when you're pretty sure there's no other option. But you, you have to ask, okay? This is my story. My parents moved my sister and I to a small town about 40 miles east of Aurora. 
the town of Strasbourg, when I was five. We spent our childhood, young adulthood, and some of our adult years there. We both started kindergarten and we both graduated from high school. Go Indians. I remember meeting some of the, my classmates for the very first time, first day of kindergarten, thinking, I hope they'll play with me on, on the playground outside. They did. I was fortunate to have spent all of my school days with a group of 12 people that started in kindergarten, graduated from high school together, and then even went to college together, some of us. As life took over and we started seeing each other more frequently because our parents are aging, which means there are more funerals, we all tend to give 150% to getting to the funerals so that we can see each other and support each other. 16 years ago, our friend Robin was diagnosed with breast cancer. She fought it for 16 long years. She loved God. She told the world she loved God. She taught her children to love God and taught her students to love God. About a year ago, her husband sent a text and said, if you want to see her, Robin, you need to come. So we did. Eleven of us got into Suburbans, SUVs and trucks, drove five hours to Nebraska to surprise her. The drive again, like I said, was five hours. It was like time hadn't passed when we saw each other. What was so amazing is that not one person hesitated. Not one. We were all there. That, that was community. We just went, period. Ten of us made it to her funeral a few months, months later. I graduated from high school a long time ago. A long, long time ago. I immediately went to college in the middle of Kansas to play volleyball, softball, and dive into biology and sociology. Those were amazing classes. Bethany was a private, out of state for me, Lutheran college. There were a lot of conditions on our education with respect to religion classes and um, things that we needed to learn as a part of our education. They forced me to be closer to him. I loved the religion classes. My freshman year, I began dating the all-star running back. Oh boy, woohoo! this is it, I'm gonna get married. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm gonna get married after college. He's the one. And to make things better, he believed in God. Oh my gosh, that must mean it's really it. No. Within a three-month period, we got engaged. The summers were spent writing letters back and forth, crying, oh, I miss you. Expensive phone bills, because you had long-distance bills at the time. My mom's like, yes, you did, when she's watching this. I heard God say very clear to, clearly to me a few years ago, you might cry today, but one day you'll feel joy. He was right, as usual. So fast forward to my junior year, I walked down the hall of our dorm, and wow, I heard his voice. Hmm. Another person's room. He's in another person's room. This is a single female dorm. I'm not sure. Oh, but God brought us together. They're, they're just friends. No. Repeatedly, for the next few weeks, I walked upon evidence that I was with someone that was unfaithful. You've all dealt, not all of you, but a lot of you have dealt with it, and it's awful. Virtually in front of my face with no regard. I don't remember much about my senior year because infidelity makes your heart bleed. I left Kansas having studied special education and behavioral science. What was I going to do with that in Colorado? Nothing really, because you needed to have a master's degree to teach special education. I wanted to coach volleyball too, but that wasn't in the cards. My sister's the one that is doing that, and she's doing an amazing job. I moved back home to Strasbourg, started my journey as an adult in the big world. I worked an odd job in medical transcription, and then somehow came across a job taking care of developmentally disabled adults in an institution. An institution is a setting of eight individuals or more. This one had 48. That was one of my very favorite jobs. It's hard to imagine to work in an institution with people that have developmental disabilities being a good place, but we really, really tried. There aren't any of them out there anymore. I worked my way from direct support and care to management, then to administration. I was very lucky to have found something I loved. For many years, it was my passion, and I was really good at it. I didn't feel complete. I was waiting for a husband so I could have some kids. Poof, here he came. Again, I was convinced he was the one. Very charming and sucked me right in. It was 1998. Before I knew it, Madison was on her way. 
She came Super Bowl Sunday, cute as a bug, right there. I had no idea how hugely I would love her. I like that word. It's not a word, but I like it. <laughs> hugely. Um, seven months later, here comes Jared. I love him hugely, too. <laughs> wow. I had a lot going on, especially when I had no help from the person that stood before God and made a bunch of promises he never attempted to keep. He was never home, days on end, the money gone, police looking for him, jail on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, but if he paid his $5,000 um, child support arrears, then he could get out. $5,000, wow, okay. I borrowed it, and a week later he came back. I was pregnant with Jared then, like I said. Numerous empty nights again, no husband, days on end. You guessed it. He was in love somewhere else. When Jared was five months old, Madison was two. It was 4 a.m., and I heard a bunch of wrestling around in the living room. And I got up, and the so-called husband had our only car packed with everything that he owned, all the, all the food from the refrigerator and all the money in his pocket. He was going back to Indiana to try to be a dad to his two older children. That went nowhere, by the way, I'm happy to say. His first wife had been deceived and betrayed when her two were the same age as mine. The similarities are very eerie. Her children, the half-sister and brother of Madison and Jared, will always be near and dear to me. They are, to this day, my stepkids. I love them and miss them. Those are two of the four things he did right. <clears throat> he walked out that morning, and if I'm being honest, I was very relieved. God blessed me with two amazing kids. In January of 99 and June of 2000, Madison, Janae, and Jared Alexander. <clears throat> they would probably be upset if I told you that I often refer to them as brats, literally. Lovingly, though. So I won't. They refer to me, however, as a dorky, quirky, cute old woman. I mean, come on. I think we're even. They are the two most astounding human beings, excuse me, in this world. However, I can't take full credit. Many, many, many nights, God saved me. God sticking around, stuck around when I pushed him away, ignored him, and at times didn't even believe in him, like I've said before. I may not be able to say how absolutely awesome and awe-inspiring my kids are if it weren't for him. He helped me, my family, my friends, and God. You may have failed. No matter what your marriage or union is like, the day of your divorce is awful. You may have lost, but you're not a loser. You may have had unfair things happen to you, but you're not a victim. You're an overcomer and a success. Stop thinking about your mistakes, who hurt you, what didn't work out. God knows every disappointment, every struggle, every bad break. And when you turn to him and say, I can't anymore, he, st he stands in front of you, puts his hands on your face and says, yes, you can. I'm here for you. Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Ask, ask God to teach us how to rest in him. The hardest part is not taking it all back when you say, Here, please help me. Things aren't happening as fast as you think they should happen, or things aren't going the way you think they should go. Being still and letting God take care of it is very difficult. Asking God for wisdom and discernment is really, really important. After my ex-husband left, I put on the gas. I got a better job in the same field I was working in. Bought a car, got food, found daycare, and off we go. Me and these two. Except I was in pure fight or flight. Each day was the same. Bottles, diapers, dressing, driving miles and miles to daycare and back. A dear friend of mine agreed to watch my kids while I worked eight hours, came home, changed clothes, dinner, laundry, bath, diapers, playing, bed. Then the coping started. They went to bed and I ate food. The 
before I knew it, I weighed 386 pounds. I struggled each day to move, breathe, and sleep. But I love my kids huge, and I was going to do it. When they needed new clothes, we shopped at thrift stores, <laughs> eBay lots, or free hand-me-downs. We, we had what we wanted. <laughs> Many of us do, do all this stuff to make things work for our families, okay? I tell this story a lot, but when Jared got a little older, he was young, maybe in elementary school. I'm not sure, I don't remember, but it was a wonderful Christmas. I had no money, hardly at all. But he loved action figures all over the place. I always had an action figure. So I got on eBay, please, please let there be a good deal. There was a, a bag of 40 action figures. I had no idea at the time whether they were in good shape or not, and they were $20 I bought them. This brat over here played with those action figures for years. He probably still has them. We would come home, turn on the light and the ceiling vent, and all these action figures would go flying because he'd put them on top of And he'd have them hanging by shoestrings. He loved that Christmas present that year. That's what it was about. Life wasn't easy, as a lot of you as single parents know. I fell for it. He wooed me from jail. Seven-page letter. Oh, but he still loved me. He just made a mistake. He admitted he made a mistake, so it's okay. So the two years he served for armed robbery of a Super 8, of a Super 8 motel with a BB gun was over. Little did I know he needed a sponsor in order to move back to Colorado while on probation in another two years. But he loved me, even if I was fat. You guessed it, he was unfaithful time and time again. <laughs> Infidelity. I would sit at the end of the street where he and his new girlfriend lived when we were going through our divorce. I don't know why. It consumed me. I gained more and more weight, not dealing with any of it in a healthy way. I didn't talk to God at all. Calling in sick, sitting down the street, staring at the house. It became an obsession. I don't know why, and I don't even know what it was supposed to have done. But I just knew I wasn't, and I didn't feel like I was enough. <laughs> One day, I was at home. We had moved away from their house. We were originally about a block away. Moved away from their house. I think it was about three months later. I said, after I told him to go, we were in the process of the divorce. I was at home getting ready to leave to go to somewhere. And I thought, my first thought in my head was, oh, if I leave about an hour early, that'll give me time to just go sit down and want to look at the house. God took me, put his hands on my back, and pushed me through the doorway. Physically pushed me through the doorway. He said, move on. And I did. It was a weird high that I didn't have to feel anymore. I fought like hell for my kids. I wanted to have all the power to protect them in whatever way I could. It was the three of us, our little tribe. He never got one more ounce of energy from me ever again. August 25th, 2014, I went to St. Joseph's Hospital, and my life changed. I had gastric bypass surgery. <sighs> Thanks, Peter. Weighing in at 386 pounds on that day. It was a tough year for us. I was in and out of the hospital, iron deficient, pneumonia, fainting, dialysis from kidney failure, and relying on oxygen. <laughs> My kids didn't deserve that. They didn't deserve to see me that way, and they didn't deserve to have to grow up so fast. I will regret that part forever. I speak at Kaiser on occasions, which I love, with friends of individuals that have had or are having get any type of bariatric surgery. I'd visit people in the hospitals to give them my support. That is my passion and what I want to do when I grow up. As of today, I've lost 128 pounds, no more diabetic medication, 
no more CPAP machine, high blood pressure meds, or having to stop and sit while I'm walking. We hike and bike and have a great time. I was working in case management role for many years with an agency that serves intellectually and developmentally disabled adults. I was the supervisor of homes. We call them host homes. They're like adult foster care. On May 13th, a few years ago, one of them host homes with, with one of my clients in it burned down and she died. I was there that night. I drove up and nine news was, nine news was in my face. I was asked to identify her body and that sounds really awful, but I was glad that I did. I was able to tell her, you are free from that wheelchair and you're loved. And I had a lot of peace while I did that. God wanted me to do that because she needed to know that she was loved. I couldn't recognize anything about her except the bun on the top of her head, but she was free. That isn't what my dreams are about. I dream of seeing the people paramedics were bringing out of the house with sheets over their faces doing CPR. In my dreams, I can't get the sheets off. It was a horrible three years with a lot of legal stuff going on. Seeing my dear friends being charged and sentenced with negligent homicide of their client, our client, their daughter and their four-year-old granddaughter. This happened at the place I worked for for 12 years. The place I was able to work and flex my time to be with the kids when I needed to be. The place that I thought was my family, my community at the time. The place I had a group home with five adults and the best crew of staff, state surveys that had no deficiencies. I loved helping them. I loved being there for them. I didn't realize I was totally neglecting myself. Shortly after the fire, I started going to therapy. Best thing I ever did. That is by far the most important part of that story, except for God. I went through EMDR therapy and began the healing process. At certain points, it was simply to prevent things from getting any worse. And they were pretty bad. God was my guy. He was there after bed, after my family was in bed. No more food. It was God. He was it. Healing has been slow, but I can't say enough about mental illness treatment. And that has nothing to do with the fact that my husband's a therapist. I left that agency in 2018. I needed some time away off the grid. So I retired for about 18 months. There are days and weeks when I never left the house. I was in my yard, my gardens, every day, all the time. I loved it. God and I began the healing process. Prayed for my future husband for all the years of my life. I knew I wanted to meet him someday, didn't know who he was, no idea. After an encounter with an old college friend in 2016, trying, to, trying out the long distance thing, I was determined, he's it, yay, finally found him. After about three years, it erupted, I was devastated. Why, God, really, why? What have I done? What are you punishing me for? Because I've simply asked for a husband. I heard a very calm, quiet voice say, I did not give him to you. I knew of Ted Hubbard through the years back to 1996. I'd seen him off and on. He was an amazing, amazing counselor with a great reputation. We didn't interact much in the beginning. I did like his legs. <laughs> I had a chance encounter with him the day before our first date. I was responsible for running fire drills on the campus of our, our work. We had to put evacuation plans. It's a packet that you hang up in the corner of a room detailing what you do in an emergency. Ted was in a dorm, the back of the campus, and I took his packet and I put on a sticky note, put here, do this, do this, this, five things. One, two, three, four, five. I was... I ran the fire drill, came back to my office, and pretty soon, here comes Ted. Hey, how you doing? And I was like, oh, hi, Ted. And, because he's not, you know, strong personality at all. 
Wait, Terry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hi, Ted. What's up? Well, you know, I have this packet here. I, I saw you put it on my desk. What do you want me to do with it? What? One, two, three, four, five. I mean, Ted, hello. And here he stands, back and forth. Well, yeah, I just wasn't sure, and I'm just not. Uh, sit down. So he sat down. And then he said, you know, after about an hour, we talked. We should go to coffee sometime. And I'm like, yeah, that'd be fun. He goes, how about Saturday? I go, that's tomorrow. <gasps> like, oh my gosh, that's too fast. We did, and here we are. This day, and every one that follows is yours, it's yours to choose who and how to love, to serve and just how to be. I pray we all make the choice to take this journey we call life with our loving Father. That is a beautiful thing. God says in his words, word, Job 8, verses 7, and though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. Job 8, verse 21. 21 is my favorite number. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter. Matthew McConaughey gave a speech at the commencement for the 2016 graduates at the University of Houston. He said the following. Quote, see, happiness demands a certain outcome. It is result-reliant. And I say, if happiness is what you're after, then you're going to be let down. Frequently, and you're going to be unhappy most of your time. Joy, though, joy is a different thing. It's something else. Joy is not a choice. It's not a response to some result. It's a constant. Joy is the feeling that we have from doing what we are fashioned to do, no matter the outcome." End quote. I like the word constant. I also like knowing that I have no choice of what gives me joy. You may be in a situation now that feels scary, daunting, unfair, dysfunctional. It affects your family, your friends, your health, your finances, your careers. You don't see how any good could ever come out of it. But if Ishmael were standing here today, he would say, hey, let me tell you firsthand, God still has a plan. It doesn't matter how you were raised, how many bad breaks you've had, how insignificant you may feel, no dysfunction, no injustice, no disappointment can keep you from what's meant for you. Remember, God can bring greatness out of a great mess. I'm sure after what we've what we've just talked about, you all can relate to some, if not a lot, of what I've talked about. The moral, moral of my story is simple. I've had so much good in my life, more good than anything. The goods come from the, from the people, places, and things in my life that surround me. What I do know without a doubt is that if I didn't have God with me, beside me, in front of me, and in back of me, I wouldn't even notice some of the good and wonderful things. I would be focused on the bad, consumed with them, and the challenging, trying to figure out how to make things good again. It's just me. Simply want to let you know that from me to you, that our Lord is 100% goodness. Whatever he touches is amazing, including all of you. Lord, as we leave this wonderful place today, go back to our homes. We ask you to watch over us. Father, according to your word in Psalm 91, my favorite verse, verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. As we leave this amazing place, we know that nothing will hurt us. Father, watch over the words you planted on our hearts today. Let your word take root and produce blessings and beautiful things in our lives. Help us to share your word with each other and with others. We leave today knowing you are our father, teacher, and friend. In Jesus' name. You gonna do communion? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Terry asked me if, if I would do communion, and I'd be happy to. Afflicted, 
right? Afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus would also be manifest in our mortal flesh or our bodies. And at Sacred Space this morning, we were asking the question, what does that mean to carry the death of Jesus in your body? Well, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. So Jesus was broken, but he doesn't stay broken. And uh, God puts him back together. And when God puts Jesus back together, Jesus is in you, and he's in me, and he's in each one of us. And your story is one of those broken pieces that comes together in the body of Christ and turns out to be the revelation of who God is and what grace is. So wherever you were, even in Terry's story, the husband that took off or the wife that's left destitute or whatever it happens to be, um, Jesus descends into all of those places. And to be a believer is to confess that he's descending into you right now. And so when you are forsaken, you're not alone. When you're struck down, you're not alone. When you're afflicted, you're not alone. But he's in you. And what's he saying to you? Uh, I know how to do this. <laughs> we'll do this together. If we're joined with him in a death like his, we'll surely be joined with him in a resurrection like his. So as you come to the table, I invite you to bring your stories, just the way Terry brought her story, and ingest the body of Christ into this body of flesh that you're walking around in, the way you think, the way you move, the way you do the things you do, and then live your life with him. Because uh, we have a picture of how his story ends, and it's way better than anything you could even begin to imagine. So let's worship him together. Father, thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brown cups are wine, blue cups are juice. And so, in the name of Jesus, by way of benediction, believe the gospel. And what does that mean? Well, it means good news. And what's the good news? Well, it's not just that you get the golden ticket so you inherit the chocolate factory at the end of the ride. But the good news is that he is the ride and he's with you on every moment of the ride. And so you're carrying with you inside of you the death of Jesus. So when you feel afflicted, talk to him. Say, Jesus, did you ever feel afflicted? Go, yeah, we know how to do affliction. When you feel perplexed, say, Jesus, I feel perplexed. He said, you know, one time I was so perplexed, I cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you want, do you want to say that with me? We can say that together. Do you feel persecuted? Tell him. He says, oh, I know how to do persecution. I've, I've been that way. Do you feel struck down? You know, he even knows how to do that. And even that is not the end of the story for him. Always carrying with you in your body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in your mortal flesh. Believe the gospel and you're rising from the dead in every moment because he makes all things new. In Jesus' name, trust him. Amen.